Well, welcome to Salford Community Church uh, today. And uh, this is part of our recorded service uh, that will be going out onto the internet. And uh, we welcome you as uh, we pray that you've tuned in uh, and uh, want to share fellowship with us as a church today. Well, let's uh, come and commit ourselves, first of all, in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that uh, we find ourselves once more uh, together in this uh, virtual way. Uh, but Lord, we uh, pray that as we open the scriptures, as we come to prayer, as we come to read your word, and when your word is preached, then we pray uh, also for the help of the Holy Spirit that you, through your spirit and through your word, will speak to us. And that we might be encouraged and helped uh, by our time together. And so we pray this now in the name of our Lord Jesus. I'm going to take a reading from the second epistle of Paul to Timothy. Now we've been working our way through this epistle on Sunday evenings. And we continue to look uh, at this second epistle. And we're in chapter 3. And we're going to read from verse 10 to verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 10 to 17. There Paul writes, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, may the Lord uh, add his blessing to that reading of his precious word uh, today. Let's bow our heads in prayer before we come to the preaching of God's word. Father, we praise you and thank you that we've come uh, in this uh, stage of, of lockdown to be able to open the church uh, for uh, public service. And we rejoice in that and pray, Lord, for the fact that we've been able to do this on a Sunday morning. Pray for all who will come and go in the church in those services and just pray, Lord, for uh, their safety and, uh, Lord, that the church officers uh, will be able to maintain those rules and regulations that we've been advised to. And, Lord, we pray uh, for this freedom that we have and we confess before you how Lord, we have missed not being together, but how we also appreciate the joy it is to meet as brothers and sisters together in the house of the Lord. And Father, we praise you as we think of uh, the opening of the church to the time when, Lord, you're, you will gather all your people to be with you in heaven itself. And there, as we see in the picture of, in the book of Revelation, we'll be able to worship the Lamb together, the Lord Jesus Christ in that perfect worship with those perfect uh, singing and, and, and songs of praise. And Lord, we are very aware also that as we have entered into a, a, another phase of this stage of trying to deal with the COVID-19 virus, that there's a possibility of what we were seeing in different parts of the country of uh, outbreaks uh, of the virus and uh, local lockdowns. And we ask and pray, Father, that uh, the churches of Christ, your churches, will not be uh, 
in any way responsible for, for, for the spread of the virus. We pray that those who will be opening churches will be wise and, and uh, discerning. And, uh, Father, that nobody will be able to point a finger to a, to a church or groups of churches uh, as a result of co causing further problems and perhaps further illness or, sadly, even further deaths. And so, Father, we pray uh, again for the leaders of our government and uh, the leaders of our council, our local council too, that, Lord, as they ease these restrictions, you would make them men and wi uh, women of wisdom and, uh, Lord, and of guidance. And we pray especially for those who are experts in these fields, that they will give them the, the best possible advice. And we do pray, Father, that we will quickly uh, come out of this situation and that there will be a freedom and, and a liberty to be able to worship you in the way that we would desire and the way that especially we believe you would desire your people to worship. And Lord, we're also mindful of the fact that many other things other than churches are being opened up uh, now. And uh, again, we would pray that people will be wise in how they open their doors to their shops or to swimming pools or to gyms or whatever is going to be opened up in the next uh, few days. And so that there will be uh, no rise in the uh, infection rates. And Lord, we pray that people will be uh, wise in, in the way that they conduct themselves. We especially pray for perhaps younger folk who, uh, who feel, uh, Lord, perhaps that they it's, it's nothing to them. But, uh, Lord, we just pray that they will be wise in realizing that many other folk, uh, older folk, uh, will be more susceptible to serious, uh, uh, serious illness because of it, and perhaps even of death. And in that end, Lord, we would pray especially for the vulnerable people that we know of and uh, ha are connected with our fellowship here, especially the elderly, uh, and perhaps those also who are fearful. We still know of a number of folk who are fearful of leaving their homes because of the fear of catching this. And so we pray for them. We pray, Father, that they may know your presence. We pray, Father, that you might encourage them in the word, that they may be able to have rich times of prayer with you. Uh, and we pray for their protection as well and their safety at this time. And Lord, we don't know why these things have occurred or why you have permitted them to be so, but we do believe, O oh Lord, that you allow these things uh, for the spread, not of the disease, but of the gospel and the growth of your church in the world. And we pray that even these negative things, even these bad things that we've been experiencing over these last few months will be a means of bringing more uh, growth into your church. More people, Lord, uh, seeing their vulnerabilities, seeing their frailties, seeing their mortality, will, uh, we pray, turn to the, to the scriptures, turn to the Lord Jesus, and know Jesus uh, for themselves as Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, please uh, turn with me to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and uh, to that section that we, were, we read, uh, verse 10. Uh, in fact, we're going to be looking uh, uh, this, uh, today at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and uh, especially we're going to be just focusing on uh, verse 10. In the first half of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, that first half of that chapter was pretty negative in, one, in some ways. And we mentioned this uh, last Sunday. Uh, Paul is looking uh, to the future, to the future of the church and to the future ministry of Timothy as he and others will have to uh, uh, assume leadership of the early church. And what he sees is difficult, difficulties, problems. Uh, he says in the first part of chapter 3 about the problems in the church. 
and the, the growing problems of false teachers being in the church and turning the people's uh, hearts uh, away from the, the truth of the gospel. And he even begins to think of those who had been prominent leaders uh, who have turned their backs on Jesus for the love of the world. And he'll uh, talk more about that in the next chapter, in chapter 4. But all that is quite discouraging, and we don't, we don't really want to be discouraged. And I'm sure that Paul, in one sense, doesn't want us to be discouraged. So, so you want to ask Paul, if you like, in the second half of the chapter, after all that negative stuff, have you got anything positive to say to Timothy, Paul? Something that's going to encourage him as a, a, a young leader in the early church. And perhaps we can broaden that out and say, have you got anything positive to tell us, uh, Paul, about our own situation so many centuries later? Well, as you would expect, the answer uh, from uh, this chapter would be yes, there are positives. And uh, I want to... Uh, share with you or highlight with you three positives. Now, it was my intention that we would do all three positives in this sermon, uh, but I only managed to do one. Uh, the next two hopefully will come next time we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. So the positive, what is the positive, the first positive uh, this, uh, today? Well, the answer is verse 10, where Paul tells us Oh, he's writing to Timothy, remember, so he's, he's, he's telling Timothy, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, persecution. So the positive that Paul is giving to us here is this. Carefully follow Paul's example. Carefully follow Paul's example. And Paul here, in making this statement, of course, is saying that Timothy is already doing that. He is already carefully following Paul's example. Uh, that's what he's been doing as a young minister there pastoring in the church at Ephesus. Uh, but we perhaps need to ask ourselves, what should we carefully note in Paul's life so that we might follow him? Well, I think he gives us a list. The list here in verse 10, it moves into verse 11, but we're not going to be touching that uh, today. But th that list in verse 10, where he says, uh, you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. So the first thing is this. Paul talks about doctrine. My doctrine, Paul's teaching. So let's remind ourselves, first of all, that Timothy knows a great deal about the doctrine of Paul, the teaching of Paul, because uh, he's been a companion of Paul uh, through the th second and the third missionary journeys that Paul made uh, as he sought to reach the go preach the gospel to the Gentile world. And uh, uh, probably, I would think almost certainly, he had met and he'd heard Paul in the first missionary journey when Paul began that work to the Gentiles with Barnabas. And it may be that through the ministry of Paul, uh, that Timothy had come to faith in the first place. So he knows Paul's doctrine, Paul's teaching very, very well. But Paul says something very interesting, I think, here. He says, you have carefully followed my doctrine. Now, in saying that, and especially when you think of what he said at the first part of chapter 3, he's saying that his doctrine is true, it's correct, and it's without fault. Because in the first part of chapter 3, he was talking about the false teachers. And now they were uh, causing gullible people to follow them. But he's saying to Timothy, his teaching is the truth. It's the right teaching. It's uh, it's. Uh, correct it's without fault but let's ask a question how can paul say that how can paul say that his teaching is right and the others teaching is wrong well the answer is it's because he is an apostle 
and he's an apostle with a capital A. A special and a unique group of people, the first generation of apostles, well, I should say, the first generation of leaders of the Christian church. They were specially and uniquely called of God, and called of Jesus, to preach infallibly and inerrantly the word of God, to preach without error, to preach the absolute truth of, what, of God's word. So as they preached and, and as they taught, they were teaching what God was saying. Now, uh, we're not apostles, and uh, the apostles uh, died out with the last of those apostles, probably, uh, almost certainly, John. But we are also call, call, sorry, called to follow Paul's doctrine, Paul's teaching. But where do you find Paul's teaching? Where do you find Paul's doctrine? We find it in the Holy Scripture. We find it in the Bible, don't we? In fact, Paul tells us about the scriptures in this chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It's a very well-known verse. Let me read it to you. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, I must confess, I do like the NIV version where it says all scripture is God-breathed. Um, because the, the Greek, uh, which is translated here in the New King James Version is, uh, as inspiration, is uh, talking about the outbreathing of, of God here. You see, Paul's letters, as we have them in the Bible, are God's word. Because Paul is an apostle, and his teaching is infallible, inerrant, without error, uh, the truth of God. Paul's teaching is the Bible's teaching. So that was the first thing, Paul's doctrine. The second is that uh, we are to follow Paul's way of life. And Paul speaks about that in the next part of the verse 10. He speaks about carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. And in a way, I think when Paul's talking about his way of life, his manner of life, he then naturally goes into a list of the things that, that he sees as, as important in his manner of life, his way of life. And so he gives us a list here. And the list begins with the, the word purpose. Purpose. What was Paul's purpose in life. What was Paul's purpose in life as an apostle? Well, you don't have to go far in the letters that Paul writes, and we find them, in the, of course, in the New Testament, to discover his purpose. But one particular verse, Romans 15 and verse 20, highlights his purpose very clearly for us. And Paul says this, And so... I have made it my aim. That word aim could be translated as purpose. I have made it my purpose to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named, lest I build on another man's foundation. That's the Apostle Paul's purpose. It was to preach the gospel and to preach it in those places, uh, in the Gentile world, in the Roman Empire, as it were, where they had not heard of Jesus and they didn't know anything at all about the gospel. Well, that's, that's, that's the apostle's purpose. And that was a unique and a special purpose that he had. But I think we can draw from what Paul says about his purpose uh, to what we should be doing. What is our purpose as believers in the Lord Jesus? And I think the purpose that we have as Christians is to be a servant of Christ. Paul, in many, many uh, of his letters, describes himself as a servant of Christ Jesus. Sometimes he uses the phrase as a slave of Christ Jesus. And that's, that should be us, uh, servants of Christ Jesus. 
those who have given our lives, our very being, to serve our Savior, to serve Jesus Christ. Paul's servanthood was to preach the gospel in lands where the gospel was not being preached and where people knew nothing about Jesus. But what's our servanthood for Christ in the 21st century? Well, obviously it can't be the same because Paul is an apostle. But I suggest it's still to be a servant of Christ in whatever position and circumstance uh, that God has given us to live. To serve him wholeheartedly. So that whatever you do, and wherever you are, you do it to the best of your abilities, and you do it for the Lord. I think that's a very important lesson to learn uh, for our Christian lives. Uh, doing what we do to the best of our abilities, and doing it for the Lord. It was a lesson I learned when I was a pastor of a church in Westbury in Wiltshire. It's a kind of negative lesson. Uh, because uh, in Westbury, uh, I was recommended by one of the uh, deacons of the church uh, that when my car was having problems, to go to a certain garage. And he said to me, well, go to this garage because the guy who owns the garage is a Christian. And so I thought that was probably a good idea to go to a, a garage where the owner was a Christian. And uh, when I took the car there, well, this man definitely was a Christian. We, we shared uh, the faith. We talked about the Lord Jesus Christ, but I discovered something about this man. He was a very poor mechanic. He didn't really fix the car uh, the way that I wanted him to do. And in a way, I felt that that had ruined a witness. Because people would bring their cars uh, to him. They, he told everybody that he was a Christian, and yet he didn't do a very good job. And that's a bad witness for Jesus. Because if we're Christians, we should be doing the very best we can with the jobs, with the lives, uh, with the way we treat people. Uh, and we do it for the Lord, don't we? Well, that's, uh, that's Paul talking. Paul telling us there about his purpose. Paul also tells us about his faith. Faith. Now, you can read uh, Paul's letters in the New Testament, and certainly you can see Paul's faith uh, flowing out from those letters. But I think sometimes faith can be better seen in the things that are done, in the deeds that are, that are happening in someone's life. And so I think a better place, perhaps, to see Paul's faith in action is to go to the Acts of the Apostles, uh, one of the books of the New Testament. And you can take a number of uh, uh, chapters in the Acts of the Apostles and, uh, and see Paul's faith in action. But one particular place I think is worth looking at is Acts chapter 16. Let me give you the, the background and... Uh, uh, really, we're, I'm thinking of verses 22 to 25. Uh, Paul is at Philippi, and uh, he's with Silas, and they've been preaching the gospel, and a lady called Lydia has come to faith, and then there's another lady who uh, is, a, is a slave of some rich people, and she comes to faith. She was demon-possessed, and the demon is, is, is cast out from her, uh, she becomes a Christian, and then uh, because the sort of way th that the, uh, the, s the slave was girl was being used to, to give, tell fortune, fortune telling, uh, she can't do it anymore. The demon's uh, gone from her. So what happens is that Paul and Silas, uh, well, they get sent to prison. They get, uh, they get beaten up. And they then sent to prison, and the prisoner puts him in the securest cell that he could possibly find in the jail, and he puts him in stocks, and we see what happens in verse 22 to 25. Now, the amazing thing is this, I think, that if I was Paul at that time, I might be saying something like this. You know, 
You know, Lord, I'm supposed to be one of your faithful servants, and this is the way you treat me? I end up in prison? I, I've, been, uh, I, I've been scourged? Uh, it looks like I'm going to be here for a long time? What does Paul and Silas do? They start singing praises to God, don't they? And they start praying. Well, of course, God intervenes in a wonderful way. But it, I think it shows the faith of Paul and also of, of Silas too, that they actually are giving praise to God. Uh, their faith, in the midst of the, the, the difficult situation they find themselves in, they want to wor- they find themselves worshipping God. That's faith, isn't it? And uh, I think, in fact, perhaps uh, indirectly, they're singing and their praying was used to save the jailer and his family in that account. So there's faith. Well, in Paul's list, he, he moves on to uh, long-suffering. Now, a, a more modern word would be patience, I suppose. And once again, you can see Paul's patience uh, at work, especially if you read uh, the two letters of Paul to the Corinthian church. One and two Corinthians. Corinthians is a problem church. It's got some immense pastoral problems. But as you read this letter, uh, one and two Corinthians, you realize that Paul isn't giving up on them. I'm sure a lot of pastors would have done. They would have said, I can't cope with this and I can't cope with these people. But that's not Paul. And as you read the letter, you realize that there were a number of people in the church at Corinth who didn't really like Paul. And there were different groups. Uh, Some people were saying, I'm for Peter, I'm for Paul, I'm for Apollos. And there was a super spiritual group saying, "I'm I'm for Christ, I'm for Jesus. And others were saying about Paul, well, he's not very effective, is he? He's not very eloquent, you know, he's got these strong letters that he writes, but when you see him in person, he looks a weak individual. And so, It's surprising that Paul is even bothering with them. But this is what he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. There he says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? Or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all. Something of God's patience uh, and love, which we'll come on to in a moment, for this church at Corinth. And we should praise God for patience, for long-suffering. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit that we read of in Galatians 5 and verse 22. And how we need patience uh, to be living in this world and patience with the people of the world at times, and, uh, and even long, long-suffering sometimes with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, another fruit that Paul mentions is that of love in this list, Paul's love. But in order to see God's uh, love, uh, Paul's love in action perhaps, we, we can go to Acts 20 this time. Acts 20, and uh, in a section from verse 18 to verse 38, you find that, that Paul uh, is, is on his way uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, he's already written a letter to the Romans and he's, he's told the Romans there, the Roman Christians, that he's going to have problems when he gets to Jerusalem. Uh, and it looks as if he's going to bypass Ephesus where he had been the pastor, but in fact, uh, they pull into a, another harbor uh, 11 or 12 miles away from Ephesus and he calls for the elders to come and meet with him. And you have this meeting of the elders of the church at Ephesus with Paul on a beach. And, and there in that section, he tells them uh, what is going to happen to him, what he believes will happen to him, what he, what he seems to understand is going to happen to him, that he is going to have problems. When he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be um, uh, attacked, as it were, uh, by the Jews, in fact, uh, he be ends up uh, imprisoned uh, uh, when he gets there. Uh, and he, he talks about this sadness and this sorrow that he has, and he, 
he tells them as he's sharing with them that he thinks that he will not be able to see them again and they won't be able to see him again. And they have a time of prayer together. Then verse 37, we have this very moving account. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. You see the love there. You see the love of the elders for Paul. You see Paul's love for the church there. Uh, all the emotions welling up. They love him because he loves them. So let me ask you, what is our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we really love our brothers and sister, sisters in Christ? And perhaps another question is this, and do we love our neighbors as ourselves, as the Lord Jesus Christ himself told us? Well, we come on to that final point in this verse 10 of this list, and that is perseverance. Paul's perseverance. Now, one of the things I think you can say about Paul, as, as you read about him in the Acts of the Apostles, and as you read about what he's saying to the churches, is that Paul is not a quitter. He perseveres through some of the most horrendous problems and difficulties. And there's one passage in Acts which I find absolutely staggering. It's found in Acts chapter 14, and it's just two verses, verses 19 and 20. It's Paul on his first missionary journey with Barnabas, and they're not having a very good time, to put it bluntly. They've been going to places like Antioch and Iconium, and uh, they preach the gospel. People have come to faith in the Lord Jesus, but as soon as they come to faith, there's this party of the Jews who cause all kinds of problems, and uh, Paul and Barnabas have to leave. And the same thing happens at a place called Lystra. And that's, that, that's recorded in Acts chapter 14 in those verses 19 to 20. Again, everything seems to be going well. And then Jews come down from Antioch and Iconium and they start spreading all this gossip and, uh, and uh, bad things about Paul and, uh, and Barnabas. And, and the people of Lystra, are, are presumably the Jews with them, must have drag, they drag Paul out and they, they stone him. And they leave him. They, they think he's dead. <laughs> but he isn't dead. Well, let me read to you, let me read to you the, the, those verses. Uh, verses 19 and 20 of Acts chapter 14. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, that's Lystra, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered round him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby or to Irby. Well, don't you find that don't you find that staggering? Here is, is Paul. They've stoned him. Uh, they, they thought he was dead. Well, he, he survived. He gets up, and what happens the next day? He goes to another place and he starts preaching the gospel again. Now that's perseverance, isn't it? I know what I would have done. I would have said, Right, I've had enough of this. I'm going back home. And uh, I'm not coming back again. I've just given up on you Gentiles. But Paul doesn't, does he? He has an amazing perseverance indeed. Let me ask, are you persevering in the things of Christ? Perhaps things are tough. I think, to be fair, uh, this uh, lockdown situation that we've been in, has been tough. It hasn't been easy. I don't think I've really met anybody who said it is easy. And you might have thought, I thought, that with this lockdown, that you might have a lot more time on your hands and perhaps you'd be able to read the Bible more, read Christian books more, be able to pray more. 
probably you'll find you found that uh, that your quiet times have been squeezed, and uh, perhaps you've had those moments of concern and anxiety. You sit down and and worries. You're supposed to be reading the Bible, you're supposed to be praying, but worries invade your thoughts. Worries about the family, worries about work. You might even be worrying about the church. And maybe there have been those times when things have been really tough and you've you thought, well, God doesn't seem to be as close or as near as he used to be. He seems to be a distant God. <laughs> And maybe you feel, felt like crying out like David, the psalmist, and say, How long, O oh Lord, how long? And not like Paul, you probably felt or feel more like Job. But uh, Job, if you remember, was a, a man who persevered too. He had a wife who told him to curse God and die, and he had some, uh, some problem friends as he was sitting on the ash heap. But it is often when we're at the valley floor rather than the mountain top that we grow most in Christ. It's through the afflictions and the sufferings and the problems that we have as Christians that we do trust God more and we grow more in Jesus. And often I found, strangely, that we often serve Christ better when we're going through times of affliction and trouble and difficulty, because people will see those afflictions that we've got, those troubles, those difficulties. And they'll see the genuineness of our faith in Christ, the genuineness of our love for the Lord Jesus and the genuineness of, we hope, of our love for others too. And our perseverance, you know, where people would say, well, why do you bother? Why do you bother going to that church? Why do you bother believing in Jesus? Well, you see, the reason is that we love Jesus. And we love Jesus because he first loved us. Well, Timothy, uh, Paul says, but to Timothy, Paul says, you have carefully followed Followed his uh, doctrine, followed his manner of life, his purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. But I think what he's saying is what something he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Certainly I think that's what he would say to us. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. See, Paul, in living his life, is seeking to be Christ-like. He wants Timothy to keep on following, following him in the things that he does, in his teaching and his way of life. But Paul is following Christ. And we need to follow Christ. And Paul can be a good guide, a good guide to follow, as he follows Christ also. Well, may the Lord bless us uh, through that preaching of his word. Amen. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for the example of your servant Paul. We thank you for his wholeheartedness in being a servant, uh, that his very life was Christ, and he uh, sought to bring Christ to the people who didn't know anything at all about the gospel and didn't even know the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for his commitment to the churches, even to a church like Corinth that was had so many problems and yet and and yet he he loved them and yet he cared for them so deeply. And Father, we pray that that might be true of us, that we might have that perseverance we might have that purpose of being your servant uh, that that uh, love for one another uh, uh, to be those lord our god who in our lives would reflect uh, 
Christ Jesus in some way. To be those, Lord, who will, who will live our lives in a way that will not point to us and think how, how wonderful we are, but will point to Christ and be able to say and to show how wonderful the Lord Jesus Christ is himself. And Lord, we, we pray these things in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.